You'll have to give us some precedence about the games and characters and stuff, because I don't know any of this shit. Yeah, no, you're not a Castlevania fan. You should, you should I like be, Symphony of the Night. You should play more than Symphony of the Night. Expand your horizons, man. <laughs> it's the gameplay, man. I like the gameplay of Symphony of the Night. If they remade all of the oh. Castlevanias, but with that Metroidvania-style gameplay, I'd play them. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't I, like classic uh, I don't know. I don't know if I would like that, but I really do love... Yeah, I really do love Symphony of the Night. I really do love my Metroidvanias. I mean, I think that's an awesome gameplay style. I, don't, uh, I just I don't like the original gameplay style of Castlevania, so that's why I haven't played any of them. That's what I grew <laughs> up on, though. Like, like I, I did too, but I just never got into them. You know, the first the first ones I played were the originals. It's weird though because I I thought Castlevania One was pretty fun. I hated Castlevania Two. My mom rented that. My mom like rented that several times, and I think at one point I asked her, "Why do you keep renting this game? It sucks." And it really, it's because my mom was into Castlevania probably more than I was. And then I, I rented Castlevania 3, and I said, this is it. This is one of the best games I ever played. This is amazing. So I'm going to use this point to start the show because I'm, I'm already recording, and I think I'll, I might actually just leave that little bit in there. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Weekly Set, an official podcast of thetotalscreen.com. was the monster you think I am. You have come here to beseech me. Madness can be a medicine for the modern world. This is episode 253 of the Weekly Set Podcast. I'm your host, my name is Tyson, and joining me today, as always, is my partner in crime here at the Total Screen, William Rorick. Hello. So, yeah, today I'm trying something a little bit different. I started recording, and we were already talking about Castlevania before we even started the podcast. So you got, like, a little bit of us talking about the games for, for a few seconds before I'm like, okay, we need to move on. So talk about <laughs> talk about the Netflix show. Uh, so we've, we've already talked about the first two seasons of Castlevania on this podcast, so we're going to be talking about season three and uh yeah let's get started with that as i was saying i think the thing that's impressed me the most with castlevania on netflix is the cast they've been able to get and they're not necessarily like a bunch of a-listers or anything but they're like really good respected actors i mean this season brought in bill nye uh Mm -hmm. lance uh lance reddick Mm -hmm. um jessica brown findley i mean these are some these are some big names you know yeah yeah it's pretty cool cast jason Uh, isaac too. They obviously did an excellent job. Also, uh, Naveed uh, Naganban, who is in uh, Legion. He was the antagonist in Legion. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. The Shadow the King, Do- right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, the Shadow King. Yeah, uh, he played Sala. So he was like the head priest. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then uh, Jason Isaacs, who was uh, Lucius Malfoy in the Harry Potter movies, he played the judge mm-hmm. who ended up having a creepy turn at the end. Yeah, there, there was a twist at the end yeah. of that character. Uh, you remember the character of Katana from from the show Arrow? Barely. <laughs> she was the, the was like Japanese like, girl. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, I know. She, uh, she was, yeah, she was like in one episode. No, no, she was in a few. She was she was the, the two kids that were with uh, um, Alucard. Yeah, I know. Oh, you mean one episode of Arrow? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she was in a few. She was in a few more than that. But she um, had like sm- probably small appearances. Yeah, I'm obviously exaggerating, but I mean, she played a very small role in Arrow. Uh, Jessica Brown Finley was in my favorite episode of Black Mirror. She was also in, she was famously in uh, um, uh, Downton Abbey, but I know her mostly from my favorite episode of Black Mirror, which is that 15 Million Merits, the one where they're on the exercise bikes. Uh-huh. Let's talk about the show. <laughs> no! <laughs> I want to talk about the people that were in Lost that were on this show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Locke was great in this, and so was... <laughs> I, can, yeah. I can't believe like they reunited the entire cast of Lost for this season of Castlevania. Yeah, very strange. <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> the, the actor who played Yemi, Mr. Echo's brother on Lost, plays Isaac. And uh, and the guy who played the ship captain that was, like, talking to Isaac mm-hmm. was is uh, Lance Reddick, who played uh, Abaddon. Oh, Lost. wow. So they had, like, that whole conversation with each other. That was, that's, like, a little mini that's, Lost reunion. That, that's crazy, though, because the ship captain, like, he sounds like nothing like how Lance Reddick usually sounds, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I wouldn't have even 
put that together. That's crazy. <laughs> so yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of start with something fun like that because it's just, I like I said, that's to me this is the most impressive thing. I'm gonna have a few negative things to say about Cosmic, some positive Ooh. things too, but I have a few negative things that mostly stem from kind of I think it gets a little overrated by some people, and I'm gonna I have like a criticism <laughs> about that. I'm, I'm gonna, one thing I, that can't be overrated is the casting on this. I'm I'm gonna overrate the hell out of this. <laughs> you better get ready for that. <laughs> My, I have issues with mainly, here's, here's my issue. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up my issue in a nutshell. And it's not even necessarily the show's fault itself. It's, there's a lot of fans, I see this all the time where they're like, oh, you know, this, uh, Castlevania is so good on Netflix. Like they should, they should redo Berserk and just have the people that did Castlevania do it. Or they should redo this, but have the people that did Castlevania do it. It's like, I honestly, like when it comes to the actual animation, like, and that's what they're talking about, like the animation studio, outside of like the choreography, which isn't even really the animation it's like they have a choreographer doing that uh-huh. outside of that the animation's like really stiff and choppy yeah and it's yeah, downright that's... awkward whenever it's something like slower like people just walking it's like there's that there was one scene where like all your card was walking and the two kids he was with like were grabbing onto each of his arms and it yeah. just looked weird like yeah. it just looked like inhuman and not like in an intentional way you know <laughs> like it just didn't look right like the yeah. movement was bad you got you got a point that the yeah, that looks kind of wonky at times i guess that I guess I just accepted it as the style, but it's it's fine because like because uh because plot wise, narrative wise, it really it really sucks you in. And in my opinion, this was the best season out of all of them so far. I think I'd agree with that, but I want to get one more negative out of the way before we can progress because I just I want to talk positive about this because I mostly feel positive about it, but I have a few like niggling things that I want to get out. You know, okay, get and, get out your niggling <laughs> things. So the other thing that kind of bothers me with Castlevania is um, the dialogue, which is usually good, but every so often is just really, really bad and like out of place. Uh, the one that really struck me this season was when the head priest guy, Sala, um, like when he decided to book it out of the church after like summoning, or opening that portal to hell or whatever, mm-hmm. and he decided to book it out, he was just like, oh, what the fuck? And then just like ran away. <laughs> it was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> it was just bad. Like it like they, they're all talking like almost quasi Shakespearean most of the time, and then he's just like, "Oh, what the fuck?" Well, that's consistent with the rest of <laughs> with the rest of Sala's dialogue. He, he was he, he Sala's dialogue was always like kind of short and terse, and not yeah, really. Yeah, this goes between short and terse and like oddly modern, and not and not <laughs> as eloquent as a yeah. Yeah, but like I said, there's, there's a difference between you know short and and even being say crass with, and the difference between that and being like oddly modern, mm-hmm. which is what that line was, you know. And that's that's happened a few times, like in the quest to make Castlevania kind of crass in, in like a <laughs> in like a fun way, like in a oh this isn't a cartoon for kids kind of way. Like there's some moments that just feel like really forced. Oh, they went really hard with uh, this is not for kids <laughs> in the in this season. <laughs> <laughs> and see, I, I'm I'm fine with the adult content. I'm not I'm not like a prude that's like against any of it. It's just that when it feels like it's forced to like make some point that it's not for kids, that's when it kind of loses me a bit, you know? Right, uh, right. Another example of that would be like the big like what orgy scene that was intercut with the action. Well, it, it just was... felt like really unnecessary for the most part. Like that, it ended up coming to like interesting points for each of them, but like the way it was intercut with the action was just like, yeah, check this yeah. out. This isn't for that, kids. That, that, <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, that was kind of awkward to watch. One of those more so than the other because, like, there there are two different sex scenes intercut with the action. Yeah. One of one of them I felt was logical and and was where that that was going, and I was like, okay, sure. And then one of the other one was completely out of nowhere. And just felt weird, and I was like, "Wait, why is this happening?" And <laughs> but it has an interesting conclusion, but it just kind of comes like out of like thin air. I mean, that that was the alley of card scene, but the storyline involving alley card was I I thought was the weakest part of the season anyway. Yeah, even though I like, it, I like the dark twist at the very end of his storyline. Yeah, I, at the yeah. very very end, like after yeah. after the climax of the storyline. Yeah, like like I said, like I I think it came to an interesting ending, which provides an interesting direction for his character arc, and I'm excited to see where it takes him into the next season, but the rest of the story, I kind of felt like I was kind of there. This 
is this is a good point to jump into <laughs> yeah. like outside of the negatives, just because I have it kind of broken up with character names on the show notes. It's 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 funny because you were talking like about your areas. Characters. Yeah, it was kind of funny because you were talking about your negatives, and that was kind of like my big negative that I was kind of focusing on. I was like, yeah. I'm like, yeah. So I think, I think it's a good point to break into the actual discussion of the show. So let's, let's talk about like the individual storylines rather than kind of going through the whole story and jumping back and forth. Yeah. So well, there's, there's, let's there's, start with Alucard's cards just because it's the least yeah. important. Least so there's, necessary. there's, there's four major plot lines in this because there's yeah. four characters that we're following here. We're basic, no, well, five because Trevor and Sepa are a team. So we're basically, we're following Alucard. We're following Isaac. We're following Hector. Hector and, and then we're Trevor and, Trevor and, and so, yeah, let's so. talk about them last because that's like the biggest part of the story yeah yeah so but let's start with Alucard because that's kind of the weakest okay <laughs> the kind of least necessary I mean Alucard's like the best character in the series but he's the best character but they don't give him much to do because basically his his storyline is we we meet him at the beginning of the season where he's just kind of hanging around his dad's old castle just bored with uh, eternal life. He doesn't really know what to do with himself. Mm -hmm. And he's just kind of existing. And he says to himself, like, he's going mad. When these two uh, siblings show up, Taka and what was the other one? Sumi. Sumi. Taka and Sumi. Apparently they had escaped from a vampire in Japan and they wanted, and they asked Alucard if he could teach them how to be better vampire hunters so that they can kill this vampire, presumably. Yeah, and I believe that vampire is already dead and I think they addressed that later, but I seem to recall that vampire being in the battle at the end of last season. You know what? Probably, yeah. <laughs> I, I would have to go back and double check. Because they showed like a brief scene of that vampire, you know, and I'm pretty sure I remember that vampire in the series in season but, two, in, but, in like yeah. the end, and getting they, killed. They say even with that vampire dead, there's like other vampires will take over. The take power that, vacuum, yeah. Yeah, take, take over the power vacuum, and they want to be able to just basically kill whatever vampires they have to kill. So, mm -hmm. which is long and short of it. And so reluctantly, Alucard agrees to take them in and train him because he's got nothing better to do anyway. And that he starts taking on like a family unit role with them. Yeah, he starts getting, yeah, they, as, as they trade more and more, he starts getting close to them. He starts getting close to them to where like, where like he feels like some familial bond. And then, and then it takes like this weird turn at the end where like they initiate some weird threesome with him. And well, I was before just like, that, they, they, the start, hell? they start showing a lack of trust in him because he's not showing them every aspect of the castle. Yeah. He's, yeah. He's kind of saying that the castle can't be moved anymore, but they think it can. So there's yeah, all but, sorts of stuff that like he's yeah, not but, showing them magic. Yeah. He's not showing them magic, you know. Yeah, he doesn't want the castle to be moved. You know, they, they think it's, like, important to be able to move the castle, and he doesn't want it moved. So instead of rationally talking to him about it, they say, hey, let's fuck him and then kill him. Yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's, basically, let's get him into a vulnerable position to where we can ensnare him, and he can't fight back, and we can kill him. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and then play the victims and say, like, we don't trust you. Why would we trust yeah. you? Blah, 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 blah. Even though they were having this whole family unit thing. Yeah, and I thought, wow, that's that's a bizarre twist, right? <laughs> and then... It's a and little edge lordy. It's a little edge lordy. But then it was kind of cool at the end, though, because, like, Alucard gets out of it, but he, he kills them with, like, his magic sword, which which you played Symphony of Night, so you probably recognize as, like, the sword familiar mm -hmm. that you can obtain, which is, like I said, the, the show has a lot, a lot of cool references, callbacks to the games like that. But he uses his sword familiar to, uh, <laughs> he, to kill Sumi and Taka, and he slits their throats, and this kind of fucks him up because he's 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 just like he's just like you know like I wasn't hiding anything from you, you know I wasn't I wasn't doing anything deceitful, you know why can't you have trusted me, you know why did you you know he's kind of like you know why why do you make me do this? Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, so it ends kind of on a high point, not like emotional high point, but like a, a high point as far as like being interesting, yeah. where he's like walking back into his castle and he's mumbling to himself like he was at the very beginning of the season yeah. when he was kind of going mad by being alone. And he's talking about like, he's like, I could have put up a sign that says like, yeah. no intruders, stay out, death inside, all this stuff. And then as he's walking up, you see that the two of them are impaled. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you know anything about Dracula's namesake, Vlad Tepe, 
Dracus, who is what's his name in the show as well. He's just called Dracus. Yeah. He was, you know, the real life figure that that was the Dracula was based on that this all comes from. Vlad Tepes was known as Vlad the Impaler. Yeah. And so it's like he's taking a page out of his father's book. Yeah. He's yeah. He even like mumbles something like a father would be proud. You yeah. Know? Something along those lines. So yeah, it's it's basically he's he's now kind of taken this kind of dark turn. He's in a bad place. Yeah, he's in a bad place. So I'm excited to see what that means for him going forward. I mean, obviously he's not going to uh, go full villain on us. Uh, Ho- hopefully they don't like try to do yeah, something like that. Yeah, hopefully they don't try because they do haven't gotten like to Symphony of the Night story yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's like super far into the future anyway, because like we're still with literally Trevor. like chronologically. <laughs> yeah, chronologically, yeah, we still have like like uh, there's Trevor Belmont, then there's Simon Belmont, and then there's Richter Belmont, and Richter Belmont is when si- is when he's around is when Symphony of the Night happens. So <laughs> Andy Richter Belmont, yeah, Andy Richter Belmont, yeah, yeah. After his vampire hunting days, he took up a job as a television host, a television show sidekick. <laughs> yeah. A late night sidekick. It's his best work, honestly. I mean, you talked about the time he took out Dracula as one thing, but I mean, man, those bits with Conan were the best. So the last time we talked about this show, uh, I predicted that this season was going to adapt Curse of Darkness because of the existence of Isaac and Hector. Is um, that the case? Like me not knowing the games really that well? See, I never played Curse of Darkness, but I, I read the entire plot on Wikipedia, and no, it's not the case. This this does does not adapt Curse of Darkness at all, but it's interesting because it adds in more elements from that game. So apparently one of the big one of the ma- one of the big plot points in in Curse of Darkness from the wiki page I read it was was the existence of the character Saint Germain and the uh the infinite doorway. Mm-hmm. What, or what they called it, you know. So like that whole thing, those become major plot points in the season. So those yeah. are added from Curse of Darkness, like that character and that whole thing. But again, it there's it it doesn't adapt the story because none of the events of that game actually happen in the season. Although the piece the pieces are there, which is yeah. Hector and Isaac do take on a bigger role this season than last season. Yeah, they do. Or they become like central characters. So which Along makes it's, me it's Trevor, Sipha, Alucard, Hector, and Isaac are like all the mains. So which mains. makes which makes me wonder if they're putting the pieces into place. If if there if this is a bridge and they're moving towards a full adaptation of that, or if this show is just going to do its own thing with the with these parts, yeah, I I kind of think that that might be what they're doing because yeah, I think they kind of closed out most of the Saint Germain storyline, right? I mean, I don't yeah. know really, but I mean, it seems like it. Yeah, it seems like they did. Yeah, it seems so, like there's no reason to bring that character back. Yeah, or at least not for a while, you know. And then it seems like right now that they're going to have. Uh, they're they're moving forward with Isaac and Hector. So if if that was a major plot point of that game, then it's like they kind of got that out now, and then they can focus more on the Isaac and Hector parts of that story, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, so, I'm yeah. saying all this without knowing anything about that. <laughs> well, the basic story of that game is is after Dracula is killed by uh, Trevor Belmont, uh, Hector Hector goes to living a normal life as a normal human. You know, he gives up he gives up uh, being a devil forge master and goes into civilian life. He marries a human woman. And then Isaac, who blames Hector for, for betraying Dracula, Isaac, who blames Hector for betraying Dracula, kills Hector's wife and, and, and then challenges Hector to find him, to find him and defeat him. And then Hector goes into where Isaac's hiding out to find and, and whip Isaac's ass. And that is apparently the conceit of the game. So definitely not that. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely not that. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about Isaac's storyline. It's probably less of a big deal than Hector's this season. It is. I think Isaac is... I thought it was good. I liked Isaac's story this season. Isaac in the show is, like, one of the most interesting characters, I think. I love how... One of the things that makes the show great is, like, these characters are complex and three-dimensional. You know, Isaac is not a mustache-twirling villain. There's some real pathos to him. him, You know, you can tell, like, like his motivations are born out out of the suffering that he had to endure when he was young. Yeah. You know, 
And this season, he has a real clear kind of path. So this season is kind of about him finding a reason to identify with humanity, Yeah, I guess. So Because he goes into this season just like, oh, everywhere I go, humans, I, all I do is walk into a town with my army of monsters behind me, and the humans want to attack me. Well, I well, guess I have to kill them. Well, These his, stupid humans. <laughs> this is kind of well, like how Isaac enters this season. Well, his, well, his, his story this season is, you know, like... It, what he's trying to do this season is very simple. He he's pissed off about Dracula being dead, and and he's trying to find uh, Hector so he can kill Hector, mm-hmm. you know, and also Carmilla because Carmilla was involved in the plot. So he's trying to find Hector and Carmilla so he can go kill them. Yeah, you know? but it's interesting though that he goes into the, this whole like <laughs> lackadaisical view of like humanity, like yeah. Like, oh, uh, you know, these stupid humans. I just I just roll into town with an army of monsters and they attack me. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of his attitude, and it, like, completely unironic. Like, he doesn't even see it. And like, then yeah, that's yeah, he re- pointed out to him through his story in this. Yeah, I love it because he rolls into, like, the town with his army of monsters and the guards there and stuff, you know, tell him to, you know, to go to, to take them and leave or they're going to, like, react in violence. And he's like, typical humans always reacting in violence. Why can't you just just let me be. And it's like, he doesn't see, you know, it's like, he doesn't have that perspective, you know? Yeah. So first he, he visits like a, 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 a guy in a shop who ends up giving him this mirror that he can, he can scry with, I guess would be the correct term. Yeah. And he gets this mirror and the guy, you know, so he takes us as this positive encounter with this guy. And then he gets on the ship because the captain finds him interesting and makes a deal that he, you know, don't kill my crew and I'll take you, you know, as long as you pay me and don't kill my crew. I'll take you. And uh, he ends up having, like, he plays a game with and eats with and talks with this captain. And uh, Well, at first, Isaac's just going to roll up to a ship and just kill the captain and everybody. Yeah. Oh, the the captain's like, well, then how are you going to control the ship? You know, how are you going <laughs> to... Do your monsters know how to manage a ship? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he basically says, come on, dum-dum. And, and Isaac, <laughs> Isaac, Isaac just said, well, it can't be that hard. And he's just like, if it wasn't that hard, then why would there be, you know, professional sailors and captains. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> like, come on, dum-dum. Yeah. <laughs> Think. <laughs> So the captain, played by Lance Reddick from Lost and uh, uh, the John Wick movies, basically has a conversation with him once they're on the open seas and on, on the way, and kind of points out to him, and it's like Isaac had never considered it. Like, oh, you see, so you had a positive encounter with a human. So you realize he's a human. He's one of these people that you want to wipe out entirely. <laughs> and yet now you're, you, you've you had an encounter, and now you realize, oh, so humans don't have to be evil and fucked up and, you know, without any redeeming qualities. There are good humans as well as there are bad humans, just like anything else. There's going to be good and bad. And it's like Isaac had like never considered that. And this is kind of his journey throughout after that is is kind of like reinforcing that. He has kind of a little truncated adventure where he, once he gets to his destination, or at least the continent of his destination, he makes his way. And, and as he's on his way to these vampire sisters and Hector to try to kill them, he encounters like an old lady who's like a, a former forge master. Yeah. And has another kind of experience where she's kind of like talking about how this guy who's, I guess, like a sorcerer, maybe a necromancer, maybe. Yeah, she uh, calls him like a magician. And he, he apparently has like this entire like uh, city under his thrall, you know? Yeah. And he like, he basically sacked the entire city that this old lady's from. And she's basically like, hey, he's got an even bigger mirror that you could use. <laughs> oh, he's, <laughs> he's got one he's of got yeah. yeah, he's got one of the uh, the portal mirrors. The portal mirrors from like uh, the first, from like the second season. Yeah, it's also he's got what you need, and while you're at it, you might as well get some vengeance for me, right? Because yeah. he he wiped out my town and killed everybody, and he recognizes her as like a um, forge master, a former forge master, and she recognizes him as the same. So he kind of makes this deal, and he's going on, and yeah, he just his storyline. It was cool visually, but it wasn't. I mean, <laughs> we didn't really get much of it. You know, we never got a conversation with the sorcerer we never got like i don't think he's even like credited like on um uh, well he's not he's not an important character really i mean he doesn't say nothing he's well, just that's like, my point is that he could have yeah. been like he, it could have been like an interesting storyline of him kind of well, at war with this like sorcerer figure i, I guess but instead but he it, just kind of rolls over him it, well it, well it's well it's a cool action scene uh for yeah, sure yeah yeah like like i love and also like the coolest part of the whole thing is that is that we we get to see uh isaac uh fighting legion the one who is many uh which is 
which, well, you played Symphony of Night. You know who Legion is. That's been a long time. Legion is like, uh, in Symphony of Night, it's like the living, uh, giant ball of like corpses. And it, and like, it shoots off like, uh, it shoots off like, uh, bodies at you and shit. Sounds vaguely familiar. Okay. Well, it's, <laughs> it's the same thing because they're the giant ball of like people that forms an attack Isaac. That's Legion. Well, yeah, it was a, it was a cool visual scene. It's just, <laughs> it, he rolls over him in like one episode. Episode once they finally encounter him as like a B plot of that episode. Well, yeah, because that's so, not because the whole because his his storyline is is him trying to get to Hector and Carmilla. Like this is yeah, like a yeah. Pit, this is a pit stop. And we got the and we got the fact that the the old woman sent him there to get revenge because she knew Isaac was capable enough to just roll over this dude anyway. Yeah, yeah. I'm just all I'm saying is that it was a cool action scene. I know it wasn't his main goal, but he'd never reached his main goal this season. Season. So, no, it, it, so it, it was kind of like ends. a weird pit stop to have something with so little story. It, it pretty much ends there. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I kind of wish there was like some more to it. or something yeah. with the sorcerer. <laughs> just, but, just more to it. You but, know? but but you got the sense that the sorcerer was like just completely mad anyway, and just like out of his gourd. Yeah, so. definitely. It's just I kind of wish there was more to it for like for for the end of his storyline for the season. It would have been nice if there was a little more to it. Right. But I mean, I, it was I still, found, it was I, found cool. the rest, I found the rest rest of Isaac's storyline fascinating this season mostly for like the dialogue and the conversations like like the philosophical like captain and fly size and yeah for well for yeah for like the philosophical musings you know uh, yeah like, definitely I, I think this was a storyline where the the dialogue was actually actually more interesting and engaging than the action even though it did end on a really awesome action scene that's kind of why I wish there was more to it at the end because it was right. his story of like kind of finding some level level of humanity again was interesting. Yeah. And and because it just ended with him rolling over a villain, it just, I, I feel like it's not that it was bad, it's more that it's just like it could have been more. Right, right. I get what I get what you're saying with that. Yeah, it could have done more with that. Yeah, I mean it was, it was fun to watch, but uh, I guess we should move on to um, Hector and uh, Carmilla and, and the, the, the vampire sisters. Yeah, we, in this we, we meet Carmilla's sisters. She has sisters, and they rule, uh, you know, where Carmilla's from as as a quartet instead of just Carmilla ruling over her dominion. Yeah, they they kind of sum it up in an interesting way, where they say like like Marana's like the brains, uh, Striga is the strength, Carmilla is like just the the charisma. I guess she's just like the the the, the guiding the, the the vague hand that points in the direction. Carmilla is the one that comes <laughs> up with the with the crazy ideas, yeah. and then. And and the, and then the other Morana is, develops them. Striga yeah. fights them, and Lamor does like diplomacy, like finds the alternate path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like like yeah. Basically, Car Carmilla is a schemer, and then the rest of them have to find a way to make those schemes into reality. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was an interesting dynamic, especially after like I think one of the problems with season two is they introduced Carmilla as just as like I guess was just to say is like a bitch vampire. Yeah, well, <laughs> well they 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 introduced her as as like an antagonist to Dracula, you know, like. But just, she was mostly just yeah. like annoying, you know. Yeah, what I mean? yeah, she, yeah. She was. And then, and then you had all these other the people on like Dracula's like Vampire Council were all just kind of like stupid. Yeah. And easily taken out and stuff, and so she manipulated like really dumb other vampires, and then just like like it just kind of it didn't work that well in season two, I think. But here you have this kind of dynamic of these four vampire sisters that actually works. Right. It's actually, kind of interesting. They're, they're relationship between these sisters is interesting. You actually see a lot less of Carmilla this season, actually. Because once she gets Hector back to the castle, the focus turns more on to, like, the rest of the sisters. Like, mostly they get, Lenore. Mostly the, Lenore, but the other two, even. Like, they get way more screen time than Carmilla does. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, so it's, uh, I mean, we could talk about Marana and Striga at first. So are these, like, vampire sisters supposed to be, like, literally sisters? I are these characters so. in the games that you know of, or? No, no, they're not characters in any game that I'm aware of. Uh, I don't Car think they're supposed to be little sisters, because they're, Car or if there is, then there's a little anime-style incest going on, because Car there's Car definitely... Carmilla, Carmilla's a character from the games, because she's in Castlevania 2, uh, Simon's Quest on the NES, uh, but... 
Knights, but the other the other ones are never mentioned in any video games. Because there's uh, definitely some incest stuff going on between Marana and Striga. Yeah, some, there, some anime I, style incest, you know. <laughs> I I don't believe they're sisters in the literal sense. They're sisters in that they are, you know, like a, a unified group of vampires. Yeah, that are all I th- females. I th- yeah, I sister, think I, a sisterhood. Yeah, like a sisterhood. Yeah, I don't think anybody is literally like related. Because you had this interesting relationship between Marana, who's like kind of a schemer like Carmilla, but more of like a detail orientated schemer. Right. Where Carmilla is just kind of like loosely waves her hand in a direction and says, we shall kill them. And, and yeah. <laughs> and, Striga, and Striga is just like, you know, this vampire who's like, you know, like... Massive. A, <laughs> she's pretty a big, Massive yeah. warrior folk, you know. A massive warrior woman, but she's she's pretty much on the side of like, Carmilla's schemes are crazy. And they'll ne- You know, they'll never work. What the hell is Carmilla even thinking, you know? It's interesting, yeah. yeah. But she's got a lot of, uh, um, she idolizes Marana, and you can clearly, like, see that the feelings are mutual. There's some kind of a, a relationship going on there. Well, but yeah, there's definitely a relation. Like, they, they don't even, they don't even shy away from it. They, they pretty much put it out when, in their conversation that they're sleeping together. Well, they didn't have an orgy with them. <laughs> yeah. Well, they did They did it. But, but yeah, they're, they're an item. <laughs> But that kind of brings us to, we're talking about, you know, like out there on display sexual relationships. And that comes down to Lamor and Hector. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is, this is, this is interesting too, because Hector's brought in, you know, basically naked when, you know, like treated like crap, like Carmilla just treated him like shit the whole way. Uh Like, like she gave zero fucks. Striga just wanted to kill him on the spot. Yeah. Striga just wanted to kill him on the spot. Carmilla had to reiterate that we need him because he's a forge master and that's, you know, the key to my plan. And that's the only reason, Carmilla says, that's the only reason she dragged him all the way there in the first place instead of just killing him. Lamore kind of comes in like a like a Marjorie Tyrell. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like a, like she says, she, she's the diplomat. But it's funny because... While she comes in and acts like all nice and everything and friendly, we do get we do get a good chance to see what she's really all about when Hector tries to get the jump on her and basically like force her to let him out. She like freaking she, she goes ham on him. You know, it's kind of she, fun to yeah. watch Hector get his ass kicked. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of, <laughs> yeah. he's kind of an annoying character. You know? He is kind of an annoying character. Yeah, it's in, it's interesting because like like he was the same as Isaac, right? He was he was in Dracula's castle working. Looking for Dracula as a devil forge master, but where Isaac seems to have like a purpose, you know, for for why he was doing what he was. Hector comes comes across as like extremely naive. Yeah, like, and, and like wishy washy. Like he's yeah, like, like wishy washy. He's like, yeah, let's kill all humans, but no. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's like, wait, I you like, just committed to killing them all. Oh, but maybe not. Maybe we shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so Hector, who's played by Theo James, who had a very small role in the Netflix Witcher series playing young Vesemir, mm-hmm. uh, is on this, uh, having this kind of dynamic between him and Lamore, played by Jessica Brown, just, uh, Jessica Brown Finley from Black Mirror and Downton Abbey, um, who, as I said, every time she was on screen, I just kept thinking of Marjorie Tyrell. Like she had that kind of like, it reminded me of Marjorie Tyrell with, um, try, when she was like manipulating Tommen. Right. You right. know, that, like that's what it was like watching like Lamore and Hector. Hector being this naive boy and, and, you know, Lamore being this, uh, experienced woman that was like, you know, yeah. manipulating him with a smile. Yeah. Yeah. Basically manipulating him. Now she, you know, after, after she, uh, smacks him around a bit, uh, she goes back to being nice to him, you know, and she, and even like she takes him out for a walk. She treats him like a pet, you know, she puts like a collar on him and takes him out for like a walk and shit. And like he, she actually like, tricks Hector into believing that, like, she cares on some level. Yeah. What's funny is because she puts it out there from the beginning, the whole, like, turning him into a pet, and she makes it like a joke, like, oh, this is the compromise we have to do to get out. And that's literally what she's doing, is she's turning him into a pet. Yeah. And that's, like, the end of their story because what they end up, you know, they end up fucking. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, they end up yeah, they, they end up fucking, you know, like, she basically, she basically, like, she basically succeeds in seducing Hector, you know, and making Hector think like, oh, they're a thing now, you know, like Hector's like, oh, yes, oh, oh, yes, we're in love and, you know, being naive and shit and like, and while she has Hector in this position where he, where, where he's thinking like, 
you know, the, all these feelings and stuff. She, she has him put on this, this magic ring that basically makes him loyal to her, like makes yeah. him subservient to her. Well, she makes him, he makes, she makes him swear his loyalty with the ring, which is what activates it. Yeah, which is what activates it. And then once he goes through this incredibly painful looking experience of being subdued by this ring, then she takes him and he's just completely cowed now. And yeah. she takes him to her sisters. And at first it's, it's kind of like it's swaying back and forth with kind of her tone and the way she's coming across because originally she comes in and she's carrying him on and she's like look how I deceived him and I got this ring on him and he tries to pipe in and she's like quiet now human you know the real people are talking yeah the real people are talking <laughs> yeah and, and so he's just humiliated and and at this point and just treated like garbage but then she kind of turns it around too because she's like oh in you know not I have I do have him under my thumb now but he's gonna live as well as we do I'm gonna put him yeah. up in that and you know he's gonna have really nice quarters and he's gonna get, have good food and good clothes and we're gonna treat him right because he deserves it for for being you know I guess I could you know go in advance and well, say for being a good boy <laughs> yeah for being a good boy yeah and, and she, she doesn't and she, use those words though. and and she also reiterates to to her sisters that she is also going to continue to have sex with them just yeah. for her for her own pleasure yeah uh, and and <laughs> to which I, I love it because like Carmilla reacts to that like we didn't need to know that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Striga basically says something to the lines of TMI. Yeah, t- yeah. But basically, basically, but she realizes that she, she, she is, she is, uh, Hector is her prized pet and she's going to spoil him like a, like a rich per, like a rich woman would like spoil like her prized, you know, like cat or dog or some shit. Yeah. That's, and that becomes clear when they get out of the room and they're walking and Hector starts to get kind of aggressive going like, you, my life's over. You've, you know, stolen my life. You've done this to me. You've made me a slave. And She's like, she's like, oh, come, calm down, boy. You know, like, like yeah. I, I just did what you've always wanted. Now you're my pet. Yeah. And she says it like literally. It just brings it full circle to like the the scene where she takes him for a walk on the leash. You know, right. right. Literally turn him into her pet now. So. It's weird. There's, there's like a kind of a, uh, uh, almost like a, like a sissification, like cuckoldery thing going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. Like a cuckold situation. Like, yeah. Like Hector's definitely being cuckolded. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, not literally in the sense that, you know, they're not, she's not cheating on him or anything per se, but like, it is that kind of like feeling of like putting him beneath her and like in like a submissive role, you know, it's yeah. very kind of, and I mean, they literally had sex with the, entire relationship is kind of like a weird sexual fetishistic yeah. thing you know yeah the entire yeah it is like it, it's clear that it's clear that she's taking she's taking a shine to him that is more than just his worth as a forge master yeah but definitely. but it, but it's not like but it's not like you know whatever affection she has for him is not the affection of somebody who actually cares for him it's just the affection like I said of you know like somebody in like their cat yeah, or like a, a dominant in a in a sexual relationship, except yeah. it's not play. <laughs> it, it's not like an act. It's just it's reality. And Hector, poor, and again, Hector, poor, naive Hector, could not see the forest for the trees. He thought this was turning into, like, an actual thing. I think this is going to have, there's going to be some, like, uh, hentai dojinshi about these characters. <laughs> there definitely will be. <laughs> yeah, I imagine they'll throw Isaac in there in some disturbing way. <laughs> by, the way by, by, by the way, we actually got to see nudity this season, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, they, they kept, like, hinting at it, and then they did it. It was it was. Done in an obvious way, like like when we were talking about our complaints about the show, it was done in such a like a like. Is she gonna show her nipple? Yeah, she's gonna show her nipple, yeah, like kind of way. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's kind of like all the criticisms of Game of Thrones, like yeah. about the sex scenes in Game of Thrones. Except I think it was handled better in Game of Thrones, you know. <laughs> but it's kind of like all the criticisms about the sex in Game of Thrones. That's kind of like what was going on here. But yeah, I mean that that's kind of it for that storyline. That brings us to kind of the main storyline of this season. Yeah, this one was the the most robust storyline cuz cuz the, the other storylines that we discussed up to now are kind of like are kind of like roads leading to future seasons, you know? Yeah, yeah. This one set up. This, <laughs> yeah, yeah, setups for future seasons. This this storyline 
has a definitive beginning, middle, and end. Well, the, the good, the real framing of this, and I, we could just say this right up front because it's so, it's like pretty much the last words of the season. And then also just the way the season began, which is that Trevor and Sifa have been on the road. They've been doing their little monster hunting game. They're having fun with it. That's, that's kind of like the key point here is they're, they're kind of, it's like an adventure for them and they're enjoying it. They're hunting with smiles on their face. And by the end, it's very much not that case anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's gone, good. like, very dark. And Trevor makes a comment about how we've been living in your world. He's talking to, to Sipha. And he's all, and now we're living in mine. Yeah. Kind of like we had these two glorious months, and now we've hit reality kind of thing. Trevor, Trevor's back to his cynical self. Yeah, exactly. And so the journey that gets them there is, like, like we said, it's the main story of the season. They arrive in this town. There's, like, this hostile kind of order, a religious order. Yeah, yeah, they arrive to this town, and the first thing they have happens when they arrive in this town is they meet three characters immediately like uh they meet they meet three different characters immediately upon entering this town i believe the i, I don't know like the exact order they meet these people i in, think they the, meet the judge first i think we yeah. see saint germain first we yeah we they see don't saint meet him germain. until after yeah we see saint germain kind of trying to buy uh trying to buy an apple from the stall and they they the the woman at the stall's giving him a hard time about it and you know about the amount of money he needs and the kind of money and he's like using magic to try and He's like, why, why won't you take my confederate currency? Yeah, why won't you take my confederate con- currency? But so we meet him first. But as soon as Trevor and Sipa get into town, they're they're confronted by the judge, who is like the the ruler of the town, and he comes across and he comes across as surprising, stern, stern but surprisingly kind. Like yeah. it, it's like you don't ex. It's like I've been through three seasons of this now, and 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 people like him in the show don't tend to be that reasonable. But yeah. he is like way more reasonable than anybody on the show, uh, any humans on the show have been so far. He's stern with <laughs> so, Yeah. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Uh, you know, he, he warns them about St. Germain. Uh, and then the second person to come up is is the uh is the fry is the friar the leader of the the ch- local church sala yet yeah, sala who comes up and you think oh it's the church guy you know he's going to start talking about heresy or whatever he starts talking about dracula and he starts talking about like like deifying dracula and like basically talking about uh you know how like you know like the pe- the people who killed dracula and if you knew who they were he you know he would kill them or something yeah he's like he's referring to the night creatures and stuff with like reverence yeah he's, it's it's very odd you know and and that encounter you know like like puts uh puts uh trevor and trevor on guard because trevor almost introduces himself in his full name but as soon as sala comes up trevor's like really reluctant to give his last name you know he's, he's just like he just shuts up about who he is at that point yeah he, his uh his uh-oh detector is going off yeah yeah <laughs> his row yeah. detector yeah his row detector <laughs> <laughs> is going off. So right off the bat, we know some weird shit is happening in this town. Yeah. You know. And we know that uh, um, St. Germain is like, he's like a visitor to this town in the same way that Trevor and Sipha are. Yeah, he, so, he literally arrives in the town like a few minutes before Trevor and Sipha does. Mm-hmm. You know? So he takes on kind of a different relationship with them than the others do. Like, Sala and Trevor and Sipha, they never really have like an established relationship. They don't really have much dialogue dialogue between them, you know? They're just basically hiding their presence from Sala. Yeah, they're hiding their presence from Sala. Uh, and also Sala is like, Sala doesn't say much. He is, a, he is a man of few words, and what few words he does say tend to be incomprehensible gibberish about like hell and Satan and Dracula. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's like, you get the sense that he, he is not really there in the head, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> the judge, on the other hand, has like a different relationship than what they have with St. Germain, in which the judge is like, okay, you guys, uh, you guys look like nice people. Just, you know, don't, don't make trouble in my town. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's some stuff going on here and I'm trying to keep on top of it. Don't add to my troubles. That's kind of like his initial relationship with them. In the meantime, uh, St. Germain takes his own interest in the church and kind of confronts Sala and tries to, like, uh, worm his way into the church by, tr- 
trying to convince Sala that he can uh, he could study the books in the church and give it and give him valuable information on the nature of hell because Sala you know Sala kind of writes off like the books and everything like in the church is like being being worthless mm-hmm. you know it's so, and and it's interesting because when Saint Germain goes into the church they find it's dirty there's like there's like shit all over the floor the big mm-hmm. statue of Jesus is defaced and turned upside down. You know, Sala's telling all his followers to drink bleach. All, yeah, 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 he's telling all his followers. And, and all the books, the books St. Germain was going on, are not on a shelf curated. They're just in a big pile in the middle of the floor. Yeah. Yeah. And you this, can tell, like, this is, this is a supremely fucked up. So St. Germain, played by Bill Nye, kind of like, if you're into the stuff we're into, you'd probably most recognize him from Shaun of the Dead, Bill Nye. Yes. He was, he was the, uh, uh, he was Shaun's stepfather. Yeah, yes. Shaun of the Dead. He's been in a ton of stuff though. He was in Love Actually. Oh, yeah, like yeah. an aging rock star. He's he's he in is... the Pirates of the Caribbean movies as uh uh God, what's his name? Uh Davy Jones. Yeah, yeah. I mean he yeah, he he's a pretty famous uh, English actor. You know, yeah. he's done a lot of stuff in uh in uh in supporting roles. Mm-hmm. So uh Saint Germain is uh he's he's reading, he's he's getting fascinating information about he ends up having an an encounter in town with Trevor and Sifa where where they've both kind of been noticing these like symbols that have been popping up around town. Yeah, there's these and, symbols being carved into various structures in the town and the judge notices it first. Mm-hmm. Out, outside like the town gate. And basically, basically, it's at that point that the judge kind of enlists the help of Trevor and Sifa in investigating this church, and he tasks them with trying to find out what exactly Sala is doing in there. Yeah. And Saint Germain kind of becomes aligned with them at this point because yeah. he's noticing these things too, and he starts sharing information, including well, his goal. Well, Saint, yeah, Saint Germain is actually, and the reason Saint Germain is interested in the church and Sala is because he is looking for the infinite corridor. Which is a place that he, which, which is something he, where, which is a place he has been before. He, and he lost somebody important to him inside the infinite corridor. And now he's trying to find it again so he can enter it and, and, and find the person he lost. And so through this, he ends up kind of allying with, uh, Trevor and Sifa while still working for Sala in the church. Yeah. So he's kind of playing both sides. Well, basically he's, he's looking for, he's looking for an opportunity to find out where the core or is and to get to it, you know, and he he has like this gem that he has that basically shows him the location, but and and he and he figures out that it's underneath the church. But every time he tries to sneak off underneath the church, you know, he he bumps into Sala, you know, who, yeah, or, who, or another member of the order, yeah. And and we gotta reiterate, the Sala gave him gave him strict instructions that he's not supposed to leave the main in the main area where those books are piled up. Like he's only supposed to be studying those books, and he's not supposed to be exploring, you know, the church. Mm-hmm. You know, he says, as Sala says, you know, basically tells him, you know, you're not. I don't want you interrupting our work. And you know, what is their work? You know, we get this. We get this whole backstory. Uh, the judge basically tells Trevor and Sipa this whole backstory of how, of how, you know, like, like Sala and the church were normal until the night creatures. These night creatures attacked the town, and this night creature attacked the church, but in said killing everybody in the church like it seemed to have like you know it seemed to have hypnotized everybody like he said, the the night creature went in there, and all of a sudden there was like this this green light. You know, weird shit start happening in the church, and and instead of like instead of like the monks being dead, they came out of the church with like just just with this new philosophy about hell. Yeah. So that's kind of uh, uh where so- where uh Saint Germain fits in with trying to get the information from there to Trevor and Sifa. He's like a resource, like an inside man. Yeah, giving them information about what's inside the church. What once Trevor and Sifa realize that they can trust him, you know. As this happens, they so they get a line. The judge gets you know is already involved. Trevor and Sifa gets involved with Saint Germain too, and it becomes this big plot because Saint Germain actually makes it down into the basement and sees exactly what this order is housing sees this night creature yeah so the visitor that they that's what the the order calls it the visitor is 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 isn't gone it didn't like it's there and it's nailed up to to like a cross like like jesus you know like it's very uh very sacrilegious religious iconography there 
Yeah, kind of like uh, the upside down cross in the in the main church hall. <laughs> yeah, in the main church hall. Yeah, and 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 at first Saint Germain thinks it's dead, like it's dead and been nailed up to this cross. But then it like opens its eyes and it sees him, and he realizes it's not dead; it's very much alive down there. Mm-hmm. So he ends up, he goes back, he reports all this to Trevor and Sipha, and in turn the judge, and together they decide, okay, they're going to strike, and they make the plan. Basically, Trevor, Sipha, and St. Germain are going to go down to where the monster is, and then the judge is going to get his gathered men to uh, fight off the the, the brotherhood, the church. Right. Well, Trevor, so that Trevor, Sipha, and St. Germain don't have to worry about them as they, they go to take on the monster. And Trevor reveals to St. Germain that the reason that St. Germain's coming with them is because they're going to basically clear a path for him to reach the Infinite Corridor. Yeah, they're actually so St. Germain's he's touched. Yeah, he's touched. He's like somebody actually is going to help me. Nobody wanted to help me. Why would you want to help me? (laughs) Even my stepson Sean wouldn't help me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, but but they wait too long though because by the time they decide to strike, that's the night that Sala and his monks are enacting their big plan, you know, to open the gate to hell. Yeah, the is- judge delays them. They they want to go right away, and the judge is like, "No, let's wait till everybody's in their homes and safe, and then we'll do it." Right. Um, this ends up being a horrible mistake <laughs> yeah, because it turns out like uh, those those symbols they were carving into people's houses, uh, basically basically were were put there so that those houses would ignite in hellfire and kill everybody in them and bring their souls to the monster so that they could feed on their souls and get more po- and gain more power to open up like a portal to hell basically yeah to open up a portal to hell using the infinite corridor yes which is why they have the infinite corridor there so because that's what they're trying to do they're trying to use it to resurrect Dr- dracula yeah to open up hell and to resurrect dracula and this plan succeeds in a sense partly yeah so they end up killing basically the entire town. All of the houses in the town just erupt in the fire and go shooting. The souls all go shooting into the monster. The rose, it's like bulging out with souls. And it opens up the portal. And you get this long, kind of maybe too long, shot where it's traveling through the portal and ends on Dracula and Lisa Tepes uh, sitting together in like a scorched building in hell. Like with yeah. Dracula like holding on to her or something like he's being protective. And that's yeah, kind of our Dracula cameo. That's that's our really Dracula. See from them. Yeah, because he doesn't actually get a chance to escape from hell like the plan. Uh, but but a lot of monsters do pour out of the infinite corridor from hell, and it leads to this huge battle where Sip, monsters uh, that seem almost more out of Bayonetta than out of uh, Castlevania. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, I guess I don't know. Like I can, the four winged angel demon things, you know. Those I, are kinda... I could see those in Castlevania, especially Sip and the Night style. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But I've definitely seen four winged angel demon like things in Bayonetta. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Not nothing terribly out of place for Castlevania, but they, they're awesome. They're, there's some awesome. I thought they. I thought but when was- Trevor's clothes started disappearing and turning into hair, that was like a little <laughs> weird. <laughs> Of course, this leads to one of the most badass action scenes of the entire se- series because we get to see like both Trevor and Sipha do some badass things. I love that Sipha has like her ice magic create a shield for S- Saint Germain, but then when she's like fighting one of those four winged, uh, you know, demon angels. You know, like she's struggling against it, and she basically calls that shield off of Saint Germain and uses it to slice the thing into pieces. Yeah. Like it's that was awesome. And then like Trevor, when he's like dual wielding whips at the visitor, his like, like that uh, his steel bad. whip. What it's got a name? What is it? That uh, uh, the Morning Star. Yeah, he's got the Morning Star, and he's got his his old his original his, whip. Yeah, his original leather whip. It would have been funny if they got tangled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But no, he has mastery over his whips. Yeah. So they don't get tangled. But, <laughs> but and then, so St. Germain's just kind of sitting around for most of this, just kind of like watching. Yeah, he's kind of just sitting around watching because, you know, he, he's, he's not a fighter. So, you know, like, so it's basically Trevor and Sipha against an army of demons, especially Trevor against the visitor who is like powered up with souls. So like the visitor is like, doesn't, is it going down that easy? Yeah, it keeps healing. Yeah, it keeps healing. So then, um, 
as as this starts happening eventually it, it's almost like it takes a while for him to decide to do it but eventually Saint Germain's like you know I should probably head over to that portal yeah yeah <laughs> and he heads over and he like kind of closes it oh. just as like Dracula's like reaching for it and then reopens the actual portal to uh, um to, to where his uh, his girlfriend or wife or whatever his special person or, is yeah to where to where the person he lost is and he enters the portal to be with her and uh, and he basically says goodbye you know and he closes the portal well before that her. though he he has to use the visitor to open it yeah and so he like he he hijacks the visitor kind of and then once he's got it open he kind of jumps off the visitor and is like kill him trevor <laughs> and trevor does a badass like move that looks like magic or something i don't know and maybe it's something having to do with the morning star and <laughs> uh and finally takes out the visitor uh saint germain kind of disappears through the portal yeah, it takes out the visitor. And that ends that storyline. Uh, as I mentioned, yes. Sala was like, like, oh fuck, and like took off at some point. Oh yeah. So, so here's the thing. So, so there's a twist here at the end. So basically, earlier in the, in the season, we saw like a, a child running through the town square. It's a really like, weird scene. Like I put up my radar right away. Yeah, it's a child runs to the square, and the judge confronts him and tells tells the child no running. The child has an apple, and then the judge basically says to him you know like oh you know if you if you follow these specific directions i'm giving you and go to this tree i have out in the clearing i, I grow like apples there and you can have one just go and get it mm-hmm. and and i thought okay that's kind of strange but then at the end <laughs> here when sala is escaping sala confronts the judge confronts sala and sala basically pulls out the knife he's been concealing and stabs the judge in in the stomach you know and bas- basically gives him a death blow and as the judge is is as the judge is reeling from the wound you know like the judge basically tells sala to go to the same tr- to go to the same tree and gives him the same directions he gave to that kid and basically yeah, he says like to find your safety the, the road yeah. to your safety yeah it basically says the road to your safety you know if you go there you can escape and nobody will find you and again, I thought that's strange. I'm like, why is he? Why is he doing that? And I'm like, wait, that's the same directions he gave that boy. And I'm like, yeah, hmm. I I saw that coming the second he gave yeah. those directions the boy. I'm yeah. like, there's something up. Like he's, yeah. I didn't know like what it ended up being. Just to kind of like summarize it real quick is that basically he's like a serial killer of children, but he kills them through a trap. But like I didn't know it was going to be that. But I I thought maybe he was dealing with some kind of a night creature or something, yeah. and that it was like in his house, and that he was sending them to this area where they'd be attacked and sacrificed to this monster in some like ritualistic fashion. I didn't think it was just straight up that he was just a, you know, perverted serial killer. Yeah, no, it turns yeah, it <laughs> turns out he's a serial killer. He he has because he he get he he gives uh Trevor and Sipha the same directions, you know, and they basically they they follow his directions to a tree, but they stop and they see like the pit that the judge has dug with the spikes in it and they see Sala in the pit impaled and dead. And they notice that there's a bunch of like other and Sifa notices there's like a bunch of other bones in the pit too. Smaller bones. She thinks are animals. Oh, that she thinks are animals. The judge gave Trevor and Sifa very specific directions to burn his house down. Mm-hmm. And after and after Sifa's they, about to do it. Sifa's about to do it, but Trevor is like kind of like no, no. Let's actually let's see what's in here because Trevor recalls there was like a locked door in there that they weren't allowed to uh, they weren't allowed to go in. Mm-hmm. And so Trevor's just like, well. We see what's behind that door. Yeah, he's like he, he brings up. I think his intention isn't that he thinks he's gonna find like gear or you know things are gonna help him survive. His intention, I believe, is that he thinks something's up. Yeah, and he, he wants to see what it is. But he sells Sipha on it by saying like you know maybe he has weapons or supplies. Right, right. Yeah, I definitely think uh, at this point Trevor suspects something is up, and that's why he's not so hot to just burn the place down. Mm-hmm. So they go in, they they find the key, they unlock the door, they go in and they find there's just like shelves all across the walls with like bloody shoes, which is if you've ever watched any show about a serial killer, you know about trophies. Yes. You kill people and you take a trophy. And so these are these shoes of these children. And Sipha puts together, oh, those bones, those bones were children. They weren't animals. Yeah. And then they kind of leave, burn the place down in disgust. And, And then that's where you have Trevor, like once again, 
lost his faith in humanity, kind of, you know? And so the judge who turned out to be, like, this this perfectly reasonable and even, like, kind man turned out to be a monster. Yeah, in, in like, a very traditional, actual reality sort of way. And yeah, and that makes Trevor lose all faith in humanity. And, you know, and that's a big reason why Trevor leaves the town and he's sour again. And that's when he says to Sipa, you know, like, we've lived in your world, now we're in mine. Yeah, we lived you know? in your world for three wonderful months and now we're living in mine. Yeah, now we're living in mine. That's it for the season. I thought that was a really interesting story, that little side story. You know, it didn't really come to anything, so it wasn't like, it didn't feel like it was something that was being built to. It was a self-contained Yeah, it was a self-contained story. story, yeah. Which, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a self-contained story. We know, you know, they don't have to have, like, any leads for the future. The leads for the future with Trevor and Sipa is that they're going to be around, and they're going to still be hunting monsters, and they're probably going to get embroiled in the events that are happening with the other characters. Well, it's so interesting because if you look at the, the four different plot lines, okay, yeah. you have Hector and Isaac's plot lines are all set up. They're yeah. all set up for future seasons. Alucard's plot line isn't set up for another season. It's all like character perspective. It, it's all about changing his character perspective. It's character development. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's very much, it's, it's like it's, he was in a positive place and it's taking him out of that. It's putting him back into a negative space. Right. And, and even though that's where Trevor, Trevor and, and Sif ended up in right. their storyline in this negative space. That kind of wasn't the point of their story. Or the point of their story was more of just a self-contained story for this thing. You know, the self-contained thing to show like this, you know, this example of, of you know, a town that could, it's basically completely destroyed. Like, the, the impression given is that when they leave the, the building, like, everyone's dead. Yeah, there's nobody left. Yeah, the but... soldiers that went, with, uh, that went with them are, like, seemingly gone. Like, we don't see them again. The town People are dead. Having the townspeople been, are all dead. Yeah, having been killed and had their souls consumed by that monster. The judge uh, is dead, so it's like they're they're leaving this town as a husk. Yeah, and so we they come into the town at the beginning of the season. There's something going on. They leave the town having failed. They foiled the attempt to to revive Dracula, but everyone in the town that they went to in to protect initially before they even knew there was a plot to revive Dracula, they're all dead. So it's, it's, yeah. So these are these kind of the different stories. It's interesting. Some of it's a little unbalanced. Like I said, I think that they, they, they could have done a lot more with Isaac's story in particular. Um, right. I, I really, I really wish we'd gotten more out of that because it was an in, interesting philosophical direction for his character. And it would have been cool if it right. had been more of that. And, um, and Isaac is just an interesting character in general. I think. Yeah. Hector's not a likable character. So I kind of enjoyed watching him getting, you know, dominated oh, yeah. and treated like trash. <laughs> oh, yeah. I kind, of, I kind of think he deserves it for being, like, so stupid. It's like, come on, Hector. Yeah. So hopefully his development will come in another season when he stops uh, being so fucking stupid. Yeah. I was like, come on, Hector. A vampire wasn't actually going to fall in love with you, idiot. This isn't Twilight. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> but she sparkles. <laughs> yeah, but she sparkles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought the whole dynamic of the four vampire sisters was really cool, which is a, re- a good turnaround for Camilla, too, because, she, like I said, she was just kind of like an annoying, you know, bitch character in season yeah. two. Like, yeah. it was just like, oh, she's just being a haughty bitch, and she's really annoying. And and it, and it felt like a disservice. Like, like they could have done something interesting with that character, but they didn't. Instead, they just made her all haughty and annoying, you know? And then made her just a schemer, and made her... It just it just didn't work. Like, it, it, it was a complete disservice to what they were trying to do. This season kind of corrected that. It, it kind of... It said, okay, we brought in Camilla initially in season two to say, we're gonna show you what vampire culture looks like. And they did didn't. And now in season three, they have. Yeah, now we actually got an inside look at vampire culture and how vampires interact with each other, and it was pretty interesting. Yeah, it's like it's fulfilling the promise of season two that didn't come to fruition. Right. So that was cool, although Hector is just, you know, worthless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hector's like the boon of uh, Castlevania. Yeah, he's the boon of Castlevania. <laughs> he's just useless and gets in the way. Hopefully they either kill him off by dropping a plane on him or... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or actually have him confront his uselessness and become a better character. I think he's going to, I think, I think the latter is going to happen. He's going to confront his uselessness and become less useless. That would be good. Uh, yeah. let's, see, let's see. Um, that would be really cool. And, you know, Alucard, the Alucard storyline was, 
was it was okay. It had some weird twists that didn't kind of really feel all that natural. But like we like we've talked about, it ended on an interesting spot. So yeah. So I hope they do something more with him in the next season. I just don't know what that would be. You know. But, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure what he's going to do next season either, but we'll have to see. We'll find out because Castlevania did get an order for his Series 4, so. Yep, it did because, because this season did the best out of any season of Castlevania so far. In fact, it like, I think it, it either tripled or quadrupled the ratings of the second season, which mm-hmm. is interesting because third seasons of, of shows don't typically do that. Uh, you know, it usually, usually by season three, a show is pretty well established ratings wise uh so so this is kind of an anomaly and also again it's, it's another inter- example would be like a breaking bad that just kept getting bigger and bigger every season or game of thrones actually or game of thrones yeah it's it's so it's kind of interesting for that it's also interesting because this is kind of a niche you know niche production right because this is like very dramatically adult animation this is a, and this isn't like anime this is like english you know english english language produced animation yeah it's very much for adults it kind of apes anime but it's not anime yeah but it's not you know this this is produced for adults and it's and it's based off of a dead video game franchise that only boomers like myself care about (laughs) so you heard it here first uh will is 64 years old (laughs) yeah it's so it's interesting that it's it's so successful and maybe that opens the door for for more adult uh drama animation to be produced. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I said though when I started with my complaints, the direction's good, the writing is mostly good, the choreography is very good, the casting is no, phenomenal. But animation, like I don't eh, I when people talk about them wanting this team to handle everything it's like uh it's not that clean there's a lot of errors there's a lot of like really awkward movement in the animation and stuff and since this does ape anime all you have to do is watch any anime and go like oh yeah okay this is how motion is supposed to look (laughs) so i kind of i kind of hope they grow because this definitely is better than the first two seasons as far as like production quality the animations improved a bit, mostly in the big choreographed fight scene stuff. It's still a little awkward in uh, in most other parts <laughs> when characters are just walking. It's very awkward. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope it improves a bit. I don't. I don't want this team though to do every adult animated thing. Like that's just not what I want. I want different oh. and, and well, styles I mean, and looks. I, I just, I just, yeah, that, that's that's the thing where I differ with a lot of fans of this. Is that a lot of fans are like, okay, so everything moving forward, like they should do a new Akira anime and they should have the Castlevania team do it. It's like, no, no. Have, have have a team in Japan do that that knows the material, you know, that's <laughs> like really good at it. You should get the people that know the stuff, you know, you get the right people for the right project, you know, and, and this is a, I think Warren Ellis is a good pick for Castlevania, you know, to, to write and to manage it. I think the animation team did okay. I think they're getting better. They mostly came, came from like child's animation, which isn't, um, isn't realistic. And so that wasn't in their specialty is like when they have a character's animate their specialty wasn't to make it look natural and human it was to make it look kind of exaggerated and weird so they're learning they're adapting they're getting better but yeah, I don't want every animation project to have to go through them. It's kind of like the pe- the same thing where people were like, oh, the team that did Avatar The Last Airbender, they should do everything. It's like, no, no, come oh, on, guys. <laughs> I, I just, I want more adult animation. I don't necessarily want it all to come from the same studio. That's, that's not the way things should work, you know? Right. <laughs> but that's it. That's uh, Castlevania Season 3. We both liked it. Uh, Will, a little bit more glowing than me. I had some issues with it, but in general, I liked it. I thought it was awesome. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. I am looking forward to Season 4. I put off watching this for a lot. I'm surprised that I put off watching it for so long. But I'm, I'm glad we got around to it. And uh, yeah, it was fun to discuss. So that I brings see. us to an end of that topic. Let's talk about what's coming up in the, in the next couple of weeks 
Uh, we're recording this on Monday, May 4th, 2020. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> May the 4th be with you, Will. Yes. <laughs> Today, uh, Creep Show came to AMC. Reno 911, uh, the new series, came to Quibi. Also, a bunch of uh, Star Wars-related stuff came to Disney+, Plus, but not like any... No, nothing No, no narrative shows, just like documentaries and things. You know? Yeah, just stuff that they could put out quickly and easily to fill the programming void. <laughs> that just seems to just never grow. <laughs> yeah. Or just seems to always grow, yeah, in Disney+. Plus. Tomorrow on Tuesday, May 5th, 2020, Will's favorite upcoming show starts, Turdy what? Works what? on no. True TV. no. Jesus. <laughs> the show about picking up animal turds and turning them into artwork. <laughs> yeah, I know Will is just super excited for that show. I, I think you're more excited than I am. I just can't believe it exists. I know. <laughs> I know. That's insane. <laughs> On uh, Wednesday, May 6th, The Oval comes to BET and Working Moms comes to Netflix. On Thursday, May 7th, Blind Spot returns to NBC. Bad Mothers to Sundance Now. Tyler Perry's Bra comes to BET Plus. Uh-huh. Scissor 7 comes to Netflix. That's an anime series. On Friday, May 8th, Solar Opposites comes to Hulu. That's like the, the new series from the creators of Rick and Morty. Oh, nice, nice. I'll have to check that out. Uh, the Eddie comes to Netflix, Dead to Me to Netflix, and Valeria to Netflix. On Sunday, May 10th, I Know This Much is True, the miniseries comes to HBO. This was delayed. This is the one with uh, um, Mark Ruffalo where he plays like twins, where one of them's like disabled and the other one is isn't. Oh, okay. And Border Town comes to Netflix. On Friday, May 15th, The Great comes to Hulu. That looks really funny. I don't know if you've seen it. It's kind of like a period piece, but just weird. Hmm. And it's got uh, Nicholas Holt, who played uh, Beast in the uh, the new X-Men movies. And he was in Skins and some other things. So. But that's The Great that comes to Hulu. It looks interesting. And on Sunday, May 17th, High Town comes to Stars, and Snowpiercer finally makes its way to TNT. This show was made, like, I think two years ago. <laughs> They've just been like sitting on it. It's yeah. gone through like multiple showrunners that have like come and gone. Who knows what's going on with that? If it'll be any good or if it'll just be a, a train wreck, which would be ironic considering what the show's about. But yeah, that's the TV series version of the movie. Just go watch the movie. <laughs> it's got Captain America in it. Anyways, thank you everybody for listening. Next week, we're going to be talking about season five of Lost as part of our ongoing rewatch of the iconic series that will, its series finale will be turning 10 in May. So we've been kind of building up to that. And so we're going to be doing season five. That means one season left after that. That's going to be next week. Until then, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Tyson Gifford. You can follow Will. He is at Voxel Hero. You can check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, as well as our site, thetotalscreen.com. You can subscribe to this podcast through any major podcast client like iTunes or Pocket Cast. And the entire backlog of our podcast is available on our YouTube channel. So check all of that out. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Good night. Good night. If you would like to reach out to us and make a comment, send an email to contact at thetotalscreen.com. Stay tuned to The Total Screen for the very best in genre 